Hello, my name is Karen Wayne. I'm a genetic counselor in the Department of Lab Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic. This webinar will present the general process of evaluating the clinical significance of copy number variants found by clinical chromosomal microarray testing, as well as some resources that are helpful in this process. We will begin by discussing cytogenetic variation in general, including various types of normal variation, basic terminology related to copy number variants, and the ACMG categories for clinical classification of copy number variants. We will then discuss the key information that is considered when evaluating a copy number variant, or CMV, and some helpful resources that are used to find it. <coughs> There are many types of structural variants that have been recognized for many years at the chromosome level based on G-banded karyotype studies. These include benign structural changes that occur in the general population and do not have an adverse clinical impact, such as variability in the heterochromatic regions or the length, number, or position of the stalks or satellites on the acrocentric chromosomes. Others include fragile sites and certain common inversions. And there are some copy number variants, or CNVs, both gains and losses of chromosomal material that are common in the general population and are considered to be benign. Other structural variants, such as balanced rearrangements, like translocations and inversions, are individually rare, but as a whole are not infrequently found. These do not often result in abnormal development, but as you likely know, can result in adverse reproductive outcomes. Historically, however, for individuals with developmental disabilities or congenital abnormalities, chromosome analysis is typically interested in detecting unbalanced structural rearrangements, such as large deletions or duplications of chromosomal material that are clinically relevant. <clears throat> um, for decades, this was accomplished with standard karyotype analysis, which is a genome-wide assessment in the sense that we are looking at every chromosome but it is very low resolution, typically three to five megabases. Chromosomal microarray testing has allowed for a genome-wide assessment of chromosomal gains and losses at a high resolution. And this means that all microdeletion or microduplication syndromes can be tested for simultaneously, which is very helpful since there can be a lot of clinical overlap between these syndromes, and the complete spectrum of clinical features associated with them is not fully understood. Um, also, due to the increased detection rate of clinically significant copy number variants, microarray is now recommended as a first-tier test for individuals with intellectual disability, developmental delay, congenital abnormalities, and or autism spectrum disorder. Um, there are several types of microarray platforms that are commercially available, which utilize different probe strategies. Um, differing in terms of the probe coverage, so the choice of where the probes are placed in the genome, and the probe type. Back and oligonucleotide probes can provide data regarding copy number, so gain or loss, and single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNP probes, can provide data regarding both copy number and zygosity, or the presence or absence of heterozygosity at a given locus. So I'm not going to go into detail about the various microarray platforms that are available or the software used to analyze the data, but I thought I'd give a, just a brief description of what a deletion and a duplication um, found by microarray look like for those of you who are visually oriented. Um, so this slide is an example of a duplication on the Q arm of chromosome 14 that was found by an oligonucleotide array. You can see that the probes in the red region are deviated to the right, which, indi which indicates a copy number gain. A deletion of this material would show a deviation of these same probes to the, to the left side. This shot shows a deletion or copy number loss at the terminus of the Q arm of chromosome 4, so down at the bottom. This is from a microarray that uses both oligonucleotide and SNP probes. Therefore, there are two tracks of data that correspond to each type of probe. Um, the deviation 
of the top line indicates the uh, deletion detected by the oligoprobes. And when there is a deletion on one chromosome, only one copy is left on the other chromosome. Therefore, a deletion results in absence of heterozygosity, which is indicated by the thick SNP probe tracks. Okay, so moving on to terminology and clinical classification. <coughs> The term copy number variant is the preferred term for describing a segment of DNA that is at least one kilobase in size that differs in copy number compared with a representative reference genome. But this is a general term that doesn't provide any information about the pathogenicity or clinical impact of the CMV. It also does not describe the type of copy change, whether it is a loss or gain of material and how many copies are present. Therefore, for a clinical microarray report, a more complete description of any reported CMV is needed. And this includes the clinical Im interpretation of the CMV, whether it is a loss or gain, and the exact copy number present in the patient. ACMG recommends five interpretive categories for assigning clinical significance, starting with B9, working through three levels of uncertain classifications that include likely benign, uncertain, and likely pathogenic, and ending with a pathogenic classification. We will now touch on the qualities of a CMV that are considered when classifying CMVs into one of these five categories. Each of these pieces of information is used to assemble an overall idea of how likely a CMV is to be causing a patient's abnormal development or clinical features. The size of a copy number variant can be used as a general screen, with larger CMVs being more likely to contribute to an abnormal clinical phenotype. This is part of the rationale for labs to use a size-based reporting cutoff, so labs often will not report CMVs under a certain size cutoff, even though they are reliably detectable, because this minimizes the number of benign or likely benign results in the patient's report. However, as we'll discuss, this um, use of size is dependent on the gene content of the region and the actual dosage or copy number state. So dosage refers to the actual copy number in a patient. Um, so zero versus one versus two versus three copies. Deletions are generally less tolerated than duplication and are therefore more likely to have a clinical impact Similarly, homozygous deletions may cause more severe phenotypes than a single copy loss. Um, and the deletion of the Cherna 7 gene at 15Q13.3 is an example of this. Also, a single deletion of an autosomal recessive gene by itself would not be expected to cause disease, whereas a homozygous deletion would. When considering dosage, it is important to be careful of CMVs on the X chromosome and consider the patient's sex. So CMV on the X chromosome may be interpreted as of uncertain significance in a female, whereas in a male, there may be evidence of pathogenicity. And um, X inactivation certainly can be playing a role. It stands to reason that the gene content within a region um, would play a big role in the clinical impact of the CMV. Some regions of the genome are gene rich, while others are gene poor or contain only repetitive elements. Therefore, a relatively small CMV of a gene rich region may be considered more likely to be pathogenic than a larger gene poor region. Um, the laboratory should be looking to the scientific literature for any evidence of previously reported pathogen pathogenic variants in any of the genes within a CMV to try to understand whether a deletion or duplication of that gene would lead to a similar phenotype. Uh, when evaluating a deletion, we are generally looking for evidence that a genetic condition is caused by haploinsufficiency due to mutations that result in loss of gene expression or a degraded or non-functional protein. 
These types of variants generally include whole or partial gene deletions, nonsense, frame, sh frame shifts, or splice variants. And some caution is needed um, for reports of missense or in-frame indel variants unless there is compelling functional evidence that the variants are causing a loss of function. For duplications, we try to find evidence that a whole gene duplication is the direct cause of a phenotype, which can be difficult since most copy number gains include more than one gene. Um, again, gene dosage needs to be factored in for the evaluation of genes associated with recessive conditions since a deletion of only one copy of a recessive gene would not be expected to cause a disease unless a second pathogenic variant was present on the other chromosome. Some CMVs may involve a portion of a clinically relevant gene, yet still not disrupt the gene function, such as the example of a deletion in the norexin-1 gene that's located um, within an intron. Similarly, for a duplication, one needs to consider if the whole gene is duplicated or does the duplicated region only partially overlap a gene. A duplication that partially overlaps a gene or is contained completely within a gene could possibly disrupt the gene, gene's function and actually cause loss of function. So this consideration of the details of the CMV in relation to the gene in question helps one think accurately about the possible disease mechanisms that one may need to be concerned with. Um, functional studies, both in vitro and in vivo, often accompany case reports or case series in the literature of possible disease genes. And a critical assessment of these is important as one evaluates the likelihood that a CMV might lead to a similar clinical phenotype. Um, sometimes the term haploinsufficiency may be used by authors even though functional studies may not have been done or were not comprehensive. Finally, one needs to consider the clinical descriptions provided of the subjects reported in the literature and ask are the associated clinical features specific and consistent between reports and are the features segregating in the family as we would expect. The inheritance of a patient's CMV is also a factor that can help a laboratory or clinician assess the clinical significance. In general, if parental samples are tested for a CMV found in a patient and the CMV is not detected, it's considered a de novo event, which is generally evidence toward pathogenicity. However, must, one must always keep in mind the possibility of non-paternity and other circumstances, such as the use of an egg donor. If a CMV is present in a parent or other family member who shares cl key clinical features with the patient, this is also generally evidence toward pathogenicity. And if a CMV is inherited from a clinically normal parent, this is generally evidence that the CMV is likely benign. However, variable expressivity, incomplete penetrance, or an incomplete clinical assessment of the parent are possible factors that should be kept in mind. Uh, gender is another important factor, particularly for CMVs on the X chromosome, since a CMV may be pathogenic in a male patient, even though it was inherited from an unaffected mother. Public databases are very useful and are frequently utilized by clinical laboratories in the evaluation of CMVs. The Database of Genomic Variants, or DGV, is a database that contains copy number variant data from many independent studies of clinically normal individuals. And the presence or absence of CMVs in this database can be useful when forming a clinical interpretation. The frequent occurrence of a CMV in the Database of Genomic vari Variants may make one think that the CMV is less likely to be causing a patient's abnormal clinical features um, since it's present in normal populations. However, as previously discussed, we continue to learn more about penetrance and variable expressivity, and there are some CMVs which are found with some frequency in normal populations that are now thought to contribute to clinical phenotypes. A 
Other public databases provide access to CMVs that have been found in patient populations and are extremely useful as the genetics community continues to discover and understand rare human variation. Uh, the ClinGen Structural Variation Database contains copy number variants that have been reported by clinical genetic laboratories, including the data amassed by the ISCA data sharing efforts. Um, there are other webinar resources which will describe how to use this database in detail, so I won't be providing that here. I, I would like to note, however, that the clinical features that the laboratory can provide to the ClinGen database depend on what the clinical provider who ordered testing provides. Um, so therefore, the clinical providers can directly impact the quality of the ClinGen Structural Variation Database by submitting comprehensive clinical descriptions of patients when ordering testing. Another database that's very um, nice is the Decipher Database. It's another collection of CMVs found in patient populations. It may contain detailed uh, clinical descriptions of the patients and also um, may contain all of the CMVs detected in that patient, as opposed to only those that were considered clinically relevant. So the challenge of the clinical laboratory is to synthesize all of these pieces of available information along with the patient's clinical history and assign the appropriate ACMG clinical interpretation to it. A CMV may be considered pathogenic if it has been shown to be clinically significant in multiple peer-reviewed papers or if it overlaps a region known to be pathogenic. Um, similarly, a CMV would be considered benign if it has been shown to be benign in multiple peer-reviewed papers or curated databases, or if it is present in more than 1% of the general population. A designation of likely pathogenic may be used if there are few reports of the CMV in the literature, but the reports include well-documented phenotypes and well-defined breakpoints or if the CMV includes a, um, a gene with very compelling functional data that is related to a specific phenotype. Again, one, one must use caution in the evaluation of the functional studies associated with this literature. Uncertain may be used for CMVs where there is limited or no information about possible dosage effects, or perhaps contradictory data exists. And the CMV may be considered likely benign if it contains no genes or is present at a low frequency in databases of normal individuals. <clears throat> so this slide is derived from a table in the Miller et al. paper, which is very useful in summarizing the various types of information that should be considered in the evaluation of CMVs and how each piece of data should tip the interpretive scales toward either a pathogenic or a benign designation. The factors that should make one lean toward a pathogenic interpretation include large size, a de novo event, or the presence of the CMV and other affected relatives, a deletion, and gene content, including the overall gene number and any gene-specific literature. Factors that should make one lean toward a benign interpretation include small size, inheritance of the CMV from an unaffected parent, a duplication, and a small amount of genes, particularly if there is little to no information in the literature about dosage effects of those genes. Here are some other tools that are publicly available and very useful for viewing CMVs and assessing their potential um, clinical impact. So there are other webinars that will be offered which describe in detail the NCBI Variation Viewer, which is a tool for viewing a, a copy number variant in its genomic context, and also the ClinGen Dosage Sensitivity Map. And this is a tool that provides the results of an evidence-based review protocol that an expert panel is applying uh, to rate the evidence of haploinsufficiency and triplosensitivity for genomic regions throughout the genome. We're all probably familiar with OMIM and PubMed and other ways of searching scientific literature, and the UCSC Genome Browser is a powerful tool, too, that can be used to view CMVs. Um, it can be also used to view and link to entries in public databases 
and there's a track to view the availability of gene reviews regarding a particular gene, um, among many, many other capabilities. Finally, I'd like to close with just a few words about the importance of data sharing and the impact that it can have on clinical genetics. When laboratories share their experience, that collective knowledge can result in more accurate clinical interpretations. For example, several independent laboratories might each classify the same variant as uncertain because each has only encountered it once and perhaps there is limited published literature. Data sharing can help labs determine that a classification of likely pathogenic or likely benign is more appropriate, possibly reducing ambig ambiguity for the patient and clinical provider. Data sharing can promote the sharing of expertise, so overall laboratory practices can continue to improve. This is also very important in this age of whole exome and genome sequencing, where no lab that performs these tests can be expert in every gene or disease. It can improve our understanding of phenotypes associated with variants through the submission of complete clinical data to the lab from ordering providers. It can also facilitate quality assurance both between laboratories and within one submitting lab through the comparison of variant evaluation methods and the active curation of submitted data. All of these points are examples of increased transparency, increased collaboration, and improved community standards for clinical testing in general. So I'd like to thank you for viewing this webinar. My references are listed here for you, as well as the email address for any ClinGen-related questions. Um, please do not hesitate to reach out with questions, ideas, or other feedback that you have. Thank you.